next panel is um, on steel and cement industries. Uh, our moderator is uh, Liora dresselhaus Murray from uh, Stanford University. And we have uh, five excellent panelists, uh, Pichris Pistorius from Carnegie Mellon, Eric uh, Trusowitz from Stanford University, uh, Pulakesh Mukherjee from Imperative Ventures, Tiziana Venorio from Stanford, and Riganshu Guha from Tata Steel. So we have a good variety of people, and I'm going to pass it on now to Leora to run the panel. Leora, take it away. Hi, thank you, Richard. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming for this panel. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce these uh, excellent panelists. Um, I will start off with brief remarks. Uh, I think that at this point, a lot of people have mentioned um, the very large needs in decarbonization, uh, both within um, steel and cement making industries. Just to uh, summarize that and, and make sure we're all kind of on the same page. Um, I, I will remind you that, that both steel and cement are gigaton per year uh, types of industries, which present problems and challenges both in the science of scale and in understanding how to uh, convert this very large infrastructure that is considered um, classically uh, difficult to decarbonize. Um, so in this panel, we will be discussing uh, both the science and industry uh, pictures of um, what decarbonization looks like in these industries, um, including an overview of, of the science policy and, and infrastructure needs that we really have to um, go about this. So in our panel, we have um, a number of speakers. So first I'll introduce Chris Pistorius, who is a, a POSCO professor of um, material science and engineering at CMU and is the director of the Center for Iron and Steel Making Research, um, which both trains uh, our, our new engineers in this area and builds research uh, within that area. Um, then uh, let's go to uh, Tiziana Venorio. Um, she comes to us from Stanford University. She's an associate professor of geophysics and um, by courtesy civil engineering. Uh, and environmental engineering and the Associate Dean of Educational Affairs. She has some very interesting research that she'll be telling us about in the cement making industry. Um, then we have uh, Eric Trusselwitz, uh, who is an executive and entrepreneur who, is, who has more than a decade of experience working um, globally at a top multinational cement firm um, and in management uh, and strategy and finance. Then we also have Pulakes Mukherjee, who is a managing partner at Imperative Ventures with over 10 years of experience in international business development, sales, marketing, and chemical process scale up. Um, and then we also have uh, Marie Ganshu uh, Guha, who is the head of Tata Steel's Advanced Manufacturing Research Center, um, which has some really interesting new directions that we will hear about um, in advanced materials towards those goals. Uh, so with that, I will now turn this over to um, Chris Pistorius to start us off with a uh, introduction to steel making and decarbonization efforts there. So in uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, just a few perspectives on where we are and where we need to go and, and some of the challenges of, of getting there. Um, so in terms of where we are right now, um, the global Iron and steel industry is very carbon intensive, um, really because of the reliance on blast furnace iron making. Um, so this chart shows the historical development of how much uh, coke uh, primarily is used in blast furnace iron making. Um, and what it does show is that the industry has been pretty good at, at optimizing the blast furnace but from the leveling out, you can see it's gone about as far as it can, given the thermodynamic limitations. So uh, we're stuck at around 450, 500 kilograms of fuel, a uh, combination of coal, coke, and natural gas. Uh, that means if we take an average carbon concentration in there of about 88%, that translates to 1.6 tons of CO2 per ton of hot metal. 
And if you add the other emissions from center production and coke production, you easily get to the two tons. Um, and there's not a whole lot one can do about that if one sticks to a blast furnace, unless one starts recycling the top gas and, and sequestering um, the, the CO2 that way. Um, and in any case, a blast furnace needs around 240 kilograms of coke um, to run. So we need to move to something else. Um, and that path is, I think, pretty clearly electrification for the most part. Uh, so electrification of both steel making and iron making. So just to be clear about how I shall use the terminology. Um, so steel is the final product, which we make into you know, car bodies and washing machines and bridges and the like. Um, so it's mostly iron uh, containing a fraction of a percent of carbon. Um, what we call iron in this industry isn't really the element Fe, it is the product of having reduced iron ore, so iron oxide, um, and it can contain around 4% carbon. If it was made in the blast furnace, it can contain close to zero carbon if it was made by direct reduction, but it does need to be refined further to make it uh, into steel. So. Electrification of steel making and of iron making, I think it's useful to distinguish between those. And in terms of electrifying steel making, that's something we have largely done in the US already. So 70% of the production of steel in the US is by electric furnace steel making, taking largely scrap and recycling that, which does have a, a pretty small carbon footprint compared with uh, blast furnace iron making. So the electricity consumption for North American uh, electric arc furnaces is around 0.4 megawatt hours for a ton of steel. And the CO2 emissions are somewhere around 300 or so kilograms uh, of CO2 per ton of steel. Uh, this includes electricity at the current average uh, CO2 emission factor. And one can manage this um, number down a little bit more, um, of course, by using renewable electricity. And about half of that CO2 is actually emitted in the furnace by burning carbon. And there is definitely room to, to optimize that. And that's something that we've been looking at to some extent. Um, the challenge uh, to uh, continuing down this path is the quality of scrap. Um, so the main raw material for this kind of low carbon steel making is previously used steel that is then simply remelted, reformulated. Um, there are certain elements that are uh, more noble than iron and build up during this process. The worst pretty much of these is copper. And this chart shows various scenarios um, projected into the future as to how the amount of copper in the scrap supply is going to build up as we electrify our lives um, and how uh, the existing steel grades will no longer be able to absorb that, that much copper. Copper has various quality issues, uh, especially surface quality, if, it's, if there's too much of it in there. Uh, so we are definitely heading for a crunch in terms of scrap quality, which is a real danger to um, our ability to maintain this low carbon recycled steel path. The alternative then uh, is to electrify the iron making step. So where we take iron ore, iron oxide, reduce that, make fresh iron, which then doesn't have any copper in it. Um, and one set of options then starts with green hydrogen. So hydrogen produced by electrolysis of water. And there are currently a couple of ideas of how to use this. Uh, the one is direct reduction in a shaft furnace. This is very similar to the current direct reduction operations, which already run at 60, 70% hydrogen. So it's really just pushing it to 100% hydrogen and then melting that product in an electric arc furnace, again, existing technology. So the hybrid pilot plant in Sweden is an example of bolting these technologies together and demonstrating that it 
can work. And there's no obvious reason why it wouldn't. There are some detailed things around you know, the mechanical strength of the product here and some loss in melting. And of course, um, current arc furnace operations really need carbon uh, for the quality of the product. But those are, I think, engineering issues that we shall be able to solve. The alternative is um, what is being developed by POSCO, which is um, use a smaller size feed material, reduce um, that in a fluidized bed, again, melt it in an electric arc furnace, or first melt it with some carbon, and then convert that in a traditional oxygen converter, which has some uh, quality advantages, uh, potentially. Um, so again, um, these really rely on largely proven technology. So it basically can work. Um, and there are various uh, plants uh, under construction to demonstrate that that's indeed the case. Something that is um, worth noting here is, is the overall electricity consumption which is largely that to make the hydrogen. And that comes out at one order of magnitude more than when we recycle steel. This is now four megawatt hours per ton of steel in round terms. An alternative technology then is to um, do direct electrolysis. So this is rather like the process used to make aluminum. Um, this is currently running at pilot scale, um, and it's a process being developed by Boston Metal. Uh, so it's all in one unit. Uh, so the heat is generated by mostly ohmic heating, um, oxygen produced at the, at the anode and iron at the cathode, and the projected electricity consumption is or megawatt hours per, per ton of steel, uh, seemingly an inescapable number. So to move down this path has a number of challenges. Um, first of those is the cost of electricity, which is then reflected, for example, in the cost of green hydrogen. So this is a rather straightforward calculation based on current and projected efficiencies of the proton exchange membrane type electrolyzer and the US average electricity cost. As you can see, most of the cost of making green hydrogen is indeed electricity. So to move down this path um, cost effectively in a very competitive steel industry um, will very strongly rely on low cost electricity. Uh, there is, of course, the Department of Energy target of bringing down this target to $1 per kilogram. And again, the only way to get there really is low cost electricity. So that's the one challenge. The other is just the sheer uh, physical footprint of, of renewables. Um, maybe not such a big issue here in the US, but as I'll show, show in a minute, definitely an issue in other large steel making countries. So this is a view of. Uh, what is stated to be the world's first uh, solar powered steel plant. So this is plant that melts scrap. So it's that around 400 kilowatt hours per ton of steel electricity consumption. Uh, this is part of the solar farm that powers that plant. Uh, so it covers around 600 hectares. Uh, it's a 300 megawatt hour plant. Uh, to produce around 1 million tons per year of steel. Uh, for comparison, the US uh, produces in total around 80, 80 million tons of steel per year. So if we think about how this would look like on a global context, in terms of the large steel producers, there is one way, I think, of looking at this. And what this plots is on the x-axis, the um, tonnage of steel in millions of tons per year produced in the 20 biggest uh, steel producing countries in the world. Um, Y-axis is the total electricity produced in each of those countries um, in terawatt hours in, in 2020. And then, um, 
these two lines, proportionality lines, then just show how much electricity would we need if all of the steel were produced either from ore, so iron making, that's that four megawatt hour per ton number, or from re recycled scrap, which is that 400 kilowatt hours per ton number, of course, in order of magnitude less. So for example, oh, and the other thing to mention is the, uh, the size of these circles around the data points uh, indicate the, just the area of the country, just as a crude measure of, is there room to build out renewables, whether it's windmills, onshore or offshore, or, or solar arrays with no um, you know, measure taken off, is there enough sunshine or anything like that? But if we look at a country like South Korea uh, that produces a lot of steel, um, if all of that were to be to produced by electrolysis, either directly or via hydrogen, that would consume a third as much electricity as the whole of South Korea suddenly uh, currently uh, consumes. In the US, it's a much smaller fraction, really because our denominator is so much larger. We produce so much electricity for, for other purposes. But this, uh, I think, really means there will be this global trade uh, in hydrogen, which um, you know, there are various arena reports that indicate this as, as well. So it's, it's really a global effort that will be required uh, to get there. Um, so as we move uh, in this direction, just the last couple of points, uh, how can we uh, squeeze the current technology down uh, in terms of CO2 emissions? Uh, in the case of the blast furnace, um, there is some promise to pre-reducing the feed externally uh, using natural gas and, and feeding that to the furnace, essentially using the blast furnace mostly as a melting unit. Uh, the most promising really is, is maximizing our use of the electric furnace, whether it's to melt direct reduced iron, definitely maximizing scrap use, and then also looking at how much carbon do we really need to use in that while, of course, using renewable electricity. So this is just a simple summary of, of this spectrum of possibilities, and there's a short recent communication that uh, explains these, but you can see there is a wide range of carbon footprints achievable with existing technology. Uh, for example, that's the existing electric arc furnace operations. Uh, if we run that with renewable electricity, we get, of course, much closer to zero. If we have to make DRI using natural gas, then we're back up at around 900 kilograms. As a closing point, um, this industry has changed considerably in the past. Um, so there is definitely room and opportunity and willingness to change. So for example, this shows how the different oxygen converter processes have changed in steel making. So for example, the basic oxygen furnace took just a little bit over a decade to completely overtake the previous dominant technology of open arc steel making. So I think uh, if there is a compelling technical solution uh, combined with a compelling um, economic necessity, this industry can can definitely change um, and quite rapidly too. So thank you. Those those were my few thoughts. Thank you very much, Chris, um, for a very interesting talk um, and and perspective on this. Uh, so now I will turn this over to um, Tiziana. Uh, Venorio to give us um, an introduction and, and perspective on, on cement making and decarbonization strategies there. And I will also mention that for those of you who have questions or comments, please do include them in the chat um, and we will get to those uh, towards the end of the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Leora. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to contribute to this workshop and share my uh, perspective on decarbonizing cement manufacturing. Um, I'm going also to share today the approach we are taking at Stanford uh, to decarbonize cement and in particular the philosophy behind our work which is 
Tackling cement decarbonation requires a geoscience and engineering uh, partnership, especially if the goal is to degree, decrease indeed uh, carbon emissions, but also increase the um, uh, serviceability and durability of concrete. If we think uh, that modern concrete has relatively short lifespan, in average 80 uh, years, which certainly does not bode well uh, for its total carbon uh, footprint. But let's start with uh, what's at stake uh, here. Concrete is the most commonly used man-made material on earth. It's a construction materials used extensively in buildings, bridges, dams, and wells. And recent data um, here show that 30 uh, million uh, tons of concrete is used each year worldwide, and the demand uh, is um, increasing. The, the demand of concrete is growing more steeply compared um, to the demand of steel and uh, wood. And this graph also shows that uh, the um, as uh, on a uh, per capita um, standpoint, uh, this corresponds to three times as much as 40 years uh, ago. Many of these applications also, I have to say, that uh, requires performance in harsh environment, whether it's at sea or at depth uh, in the subsurface. Let's think, for example, of methane leaks from well bore cement uh, shifts. But cements, we know that has a non negligible carbon footprint. Uh, its manufacturing is responsible for 80, 11% uh, of the world's CO2 emissions. And uh, here I like to emphasize that although cement decarbonization is an engineering problem. At the root of it, the biggest challenge in the cement making comes from the field of geoscience. In fact, to paraphrase uh, the head of, um, of um, research and uh, development at CEMEX, uh, he mentioned that decarbonizing cement uh, is not rocket science, but actually rock science. Why? Fundamentally, for two reasons. The first reason is that cement manufacturing starts with the limestone rocks made of calcite or calcium uh, carbonate uh, minerals, which are thermally decomposed to produce uh, lime. Calcination, we know it's a, a high temperature process that requires the use of energy. Generally, energy comes from the fossil fuels. And that is responsible more or less uh, for 25, 30% of the emissions. But then the uh, carbon, the calcination process um, um, is uh, basically um, breaks down the molecule of uh, calcite or calcium carbonates to produce calcium oxide, also known as quicklime. And that process releases um, CO2. And this process contributes um, uh, to 60%, 70% of the emissions. I'm not considering here the transportation. Mining carbonate rocks for uh, the cement industry is estimated to be about 2 billion tons of rocks uh, per year worldwide, which translate into 1,300 megatons uh, of CO2 emitted per year. This figure corresponds roughly to the emissions generated uh, yearly by all cars circulate, circulating in the US. So the first lesson that we can draw from this is that even though the ever ch uh, changing uh, landscape of a more efficient energy technology may offer solutions that may help reduce the emissions that comes from the energy use, searching for an alternative uh, material that drastically reduces the majority of the emissions that comes from the calcination of limestone rocks remains absolutely the priority. And so finding an alternative earth materials is a rock science uh, problem. Then we know that calcium oxide is mixed with aluminosilicates, clay ash, fly ash, gypsum that serves as a moderator and all together is the recipe for Portland cement. But then to make concrete, cement is mixed with aggregates, generally sand size, gravel size materials, water, 
and then steel bar. And this is because of the tensile stress of, sorry, the tensile strength of concrete is low. And, uh, and so steel is used as a reinforcement to prevent cracks from propagating. And it's really the reinforcement that leads to the second issue. Not only data indicate that the ordinary reinforced concrete emits approximately 15% more carbon dioxide than the voided concrete, concrete system, but also the corrosion of reinforcing steel is the leading uh, cause of deterioration in concrete. But nature may come uh, to our uh, rescue. We know in the geosciences that fractured rock systems cement naturally and exhibit high strengths without any reinforcement. In fact, we can think of uh, active folds that you can see uh, here of the earth crust as a large scale kiln factories. They mechanically pulverize rocks to the micron and finer um, scale during earthquakes and then internally channel heat that prime the sediment for fluid mediated reaction, which eventually form a concrete like rocks without any apparent reinforcement. But actually reinforcement exists just at a scale that is not visible to the naked eye. In fact, nano uh, does not always equate with manufacture. This SCM uh, here, this SCM image shows the aluminosilicate cement of certain rocks and cement appears as a tangle of nanominerals uh, fibers. You can see here the scale 500 uh, nano. Other times fibrous minerals are also well aligned. So this shows that earth is an excellent nano nanotechnologist that use water uh, for its chemistry. However, we know from the, from the engineering that fibers are added to material to increase toughness and stiffness uh, as they bridge fractures and also deflect um, the path of uh, cracks. So overall, we know that fiber reinforced materials are able to accommodate strain and absorb strain energy preventing uh, brittle failure. But then the addition of fibers into materials leads to a couple of reflection. From a practical point of view, there is a limit to which we can mix fibers into a paste, because we need to know that the higher the amount of fibers that we add to any slurry, the greater it is, is the viscosity, and then the lower is the workability of the composite. The second reflection to make here is that we need also to increase the strength at the fiber uh, matrix um, interface. Uh, if the shear strength here is uh, low or the bonding is poor, we have um, fiber debonding, uh, which um, clearly um, is, uh, it, 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 it decreases the strength of the, of the composite. But even in this case, uh, nature can come into, uh, can uh, help us. Um, the, we have seen that uh, um, uh, rocks may exhibit uh, fibers that may be entangled and aligned. And in this plot here, I show that uh, uh, the, stress and stress, the stress and strain behavior of different arrangements of fibers from disordered uh, here to entangled. Uh, and uh, uh, entangled arrangements, disordered arrangements show a more ductile behavior while aligned uh, macrostructures exhibit a more brittle uh, failure. This is not surprising uh, because we know, for example, that ropes that are made out of braided uh, or knotted uh, uh, strands are known to be tougher. And that's what we want uh, for cement. In this realization, I want to mention that the number of fibers uh, per uh, volume uh, unit is the same. But in order to maintain the strain and then increase the strength, we need to make this fibers uh, try, which means increase the number of fibers. So um, we are using, and this is the work that we are doing at Stanford, a geomimetic uh, approach that is using uh, all the aspects that I've been talking so far. As with biomimetics that are brought us many 
transformative materials from Velcro to um, um, uh, adhesive inspired by the gecko skins, we are harnessing earth design to mimic certain rock functionalities and processes. And this includes a new rock composition and also fibers entangled uh, entanglement for reinforcement at the nanoscale. So we are using an alternative binder precursor. So basically a new rocks that replaces uh, limestone. The plot here shows uh, the mass loss um, that the new binder precursors experience uh, uh, upon cal uh, calcination, the mass, you can consider the mass loss as a proxy for the amount of CO2 emitted upon, uh, upon uh, calcination. And for comparison here, I'm showing the data from limestone. So the difference uh, mm, which is given by the two slopes uh, is striking. At the same time, we are also studying how to grow mineral fibers uh, within the binder. You can see here uh, that uh, fibers can uh, are literally sprouting from the paste uh, as it were a living uh, creature. We are also, um, um, uh, we are also uh, working on how to increase the number of fibers per volume uh, unit. And indeed, we are, we are working on how to, to increase the entanglement of uh, 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 these fibers. This approach, I have to say that overcomes some of the disadvantages of a carbon upcycle. Um, carbon upcycle is a technology that uses uh, capture CO2 and then recycle CO2 into the fresh uh, slurry um, for curing. And this process um, leads or transforms supercritical CO2 back into solid carbonates. But this approach um, uh, requires high cost because it requires changing the manufacturing chain. It's also limited to precast, but also the most important aspect that um, to, to highlight here is that uh, carbonation or carbon uh, upcycle, uh, upcycling basically um, pr um, precipitates calcite. And calcite or any carbonate minerals is well known in the geosciences that um, it's, uh, it's a mineral prone to dissolution and also uh, a brittle uh, mineral. These are some of the experiments we are doing uh, to show how the precipitation of calcite makes uh, the, the overall cement uh, more uh, brittle. And this is not surprising if we, for example, think of uh, fractability of shales, uh, the amount of the, the shales that, uh, in, that um, contain more carbonate minerals are more fractable because they are more brittle. So in conclusions, um, I hope that I show that cement decarbonation is as much an engineering as a geoscience uh, challenge. Uh, and this partnership is crucial to cross-pollinate knowledge and also leverage knowledge across the geoscience and also material science and chemical engineering. Uh, here I'm showing the, the, my collaborators uh, at Stanford. After all, we know that it takes two to tangle, and I would say also to tangle in this case. So um, I'm sh I showed that we are working on a new uh, natural rock blend, so a new rock that provides a more sustainable uh, binder uh, precursor. We are also using a geomimetic approach that draws inspiration from um, how Earth does chemistry and then Earth chemistry contributes to the mechanics of cementation and then I also uh, think that it's very important and time is now to cross-pollinate knowledge um, that we uh, have around nanominerals in the geoscience and nanotechnology to study the, how the, the nanoscale of um, uh, long polymers or fibers control the orientation of mineral uh, fibers to enhance the reinforcement of the bulk uh, material at the nano um, scale. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tiziana, for that really interesting talk and, and great perspective. Um, 
there was, I think, one brief question in the chat. Uh, um, Tiziana, can solid carbon particles be added to concrete? Absolutely. Uh, they will uh, serve the same, um, it, it basically a technology that rely on the, the way, for example, uh, fibers are added to uh, materials. But let's still uh, consider the fact that carbonate minerals are prone to dissolution and, uh, uh, and also they are brittle. So uh, definitely the strength goes up as I have shown very rapidly, uh, but then brittleness also increases. It's an interesting thought process of um, both thinking towards the properties of the products, as well as thinking about the strategies towards the decarbonization efforts, right? Because they're so strongly linked. Yeah, absolutely. Um, very interesting. So now I'll uh, turn this over to uh, Eric um, to uh, give us a perspective um, coming at this from, from an industry picture. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to present. Um, so what I've tried to do here is just adapt a little bit um, what I how I see emerging technology for um, cement CO two reduction um, to the topic of this um, session, which is electrification. No, um, so I'll, I'll just go through a little bit of a background about the industry. Um, I'll go through a little bit of framework that I personally use to to look at things in terms of their feasibility and scalability, um, and then I'll just touch briefly at the end on electrification to to open some. Um, questions about it. Um, so yeah, a global cement industry, 4.1 billion tons of annual production, you know, around 2.8 billion tons of CO2. You know, it, the, the um, estimates of global CO2 range pretty broadly from, you know, I've seen 6 to 8%. I see, hey, Tatiana, you had a higher <laughs> estimate. So I, I, I mean, that's great. That that's just means we're working on the right problem, right? Um, and this is a growing um, problem. So cement um, utilization is going to grow to 2050. Um, it's primarily in the developing world, and uh, and it's a question of human development because um, the developing world needs to build out infrastructure and housing and and you know basic um, a building blocks of its economy, and that cement is at the basis of all that. Um, and the mar modern, just to to like give an overview of what's the modern cement production process, you know, um, you're basically digging out millions of tons of minerals from the ground, and you're crushing them up into a fine. A mixture called a raw mix. You're you're primarily using limestone and clays and you know um, and minerals like that. You're you're putting it into a raw mix. You're heating it up. Um, it passes through a phase called calcination, where um, the CO2 that's attached to um, um, the calcium and the calcium carbonate is released. Um, that's that's a calcination process that happens around 900 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> and then from there, uh, you go into a kiln and you sinter it. Um, and you create the, the products of an intermediate thing called clinker. Um, and then you co-grind that with other things like gypsum um, or other kind of waste materials and things like that, um, which are called supplemental cementitious materials. It's very, very highly capital intensive. You need hundreds of millions of dollars um, to be in this business. You probably need billions because having one cement plant is usually not a, um, and there's only around 2,500 plants in the in the world. You know? and, and the basic um, cement plant is gonna produce around a million tons of cement or more um, to be economically viable. Um, and actually it's gonna release, it's gonna put in a whole bunch more minerals, probably 1.5, 1.6 million tons because a lot of that um, raw material is actually just gonna go up in the air as CO2. Um, this is just what it looks like. You can see the cars in the parking lot just for scale. So it's it's uh, it's big, you know, and this is this is a plant in Latvia that I, I you know, had some, some um, close interactions with when, um, when I was working in industry. Um, and then if you look at the production process, you can see basically what I what I said here is, you know, you have this all, all this calcium carbonate, CO2 just gets um, released from that calcium carbonate, your, your massive um, solid raw materials is reduced. And then you go uh, at around 900, you pass into these other phase changes and things to things called, you know, in, in cement chemistry parlance, A light, B light, et cetera. And you have to control the phases of this um, clinker material, but they're <clears throat> primarily, calcium silicate type materials um, that are coming out to form this clinker. And then it's reactive, it's hydraulic. Um, when you put it with water, water is then integrated into the structure of that thing and it creates um, a, a, a cementing effect. Um, so I, I think the most important thing for every single person to understand who wants to do something in cement industry is it is entirely governed by cost. It is a local, very highly competitive, usually commodities market. 
and it is incredibly optimized. So it's it costs like 20 to 40 dollars per ton of material cash cost, you know, for primarily for energy um, to produce a ton of cement. And this is just unprecedented. I don't know many other industries that could produce tons of material for for this kind of order of magnitude cost even. Um, so that's like the biggest barrier that you have in the cement industry to innovation is if something increases a variable cost per ton by 10 cents, people will not like it and they will not adopt it. So, so that is like um, really important for everyone to understand. Um, where does the cement come from? We talked about this process of calcination where you just basically take 40, 44 or so percent of the raw, the, the limestone itself and just release it into the air. Um, and that's um, this calcination process. That's actually by now, this is an older graph. So this is by now around 55 or 60% of all the emissions in the industry. Primarily the rest of it is coming from combustion of fossil fuels um, to produce that temperature of 1500 Celsius. Um, so what, you know, I, I would say probably just important to know in 2019, there's a real tipping point for the industry. Prior to that, it was like, there was some, some CO2 focus maybe in Europe because they had a, a bunch of regulations there. Um, in 2019, the capital holders really started to get involved and actually the price on CO2 and CO2 regulations started, people started to see the writing on the wall that that's coming. So there was a real tipping point and the top executive spend companies started to pay much, much more attention. I would say it's the number one or number one, two, three issue for all the major multinational spend companies right now. Um, that resulted in 2021 in this new plan, you know, it was actually a lot more ambitious than the old plan. The old plan was not, not, not ambitious enough at all, you know, and this is much more ambitious. Um, it still has a very large segment of carbon capture. There's no place I see in this plan. There, there might be some calculations for um, electrification, but it's really, really more like, hey, we're going to decarbonize the electrical grid. And, you know, that that's going to take away 5%. It's not, it's not about using electricity instead of um, combustion to heat the process in this plan, you know, so that's, that's really absent. Um, and, and I think actually there's, there's interesting things to do that I can touch on at the end. And, and then just with regards to my own kind of approach to thinking about the industry, you know, I, I did a, a wide research on all the, um, ways that industry and innovators are trying to reduce CO2 in the industry. You know, I kind of just classify stuff in a very simple way for myself, you know, material energy or capture, those are the main buckets and then some sub buckets under there. I don't think we need to go into detail, but that's just my framework for thinking about it. I, I looked around and actually found an enormous amount of innovation, much of which has not scaled for the same reasons that we talk. It's all more expensive or a lot more expensive. Um, and where it has, you know, a variable cost benefit, it has scaled. Um, alternative fuels, uh, use of industrial waste as supplementary cementitious materials, the adaptation of the, the dry process production to replace wet process production, that's scaled um, you know, pretty broadly because it's a variable cost benefit. And here you can just see you know, a lot of materials innovation, which faces some other, other hurdles, um, and then innovation in energy and capture. And this is just a look to say, hey, there is a lot going on in the industry. Um, and you know, why, why, why are we not seeing this overtaking the process. And, and so I just came up with a little bit of a framework for um, some sector specific considerations for the feasibility, I guess, viability and scalability of stuff. Um, and those are, you know, you need billions of tons of extraordinarily cheap raw materials. You know, that's the number one thing. A lot of, a lot of innovations fail on that. If you wanna change the material, you're kind of built on top of limestone quarry, all the trillion dollars of assets in the industry are already built on limestone quarries. You're going to change that. You know, you have cost stuff. Not that it can't be done, but it's a hurdle. Um, the economics, you know, we comment that a little bit. Extremely so a low variable cost. That that's probably the biggest um, hurdle for most of the technologies. The incumbents. There's about a trillion dollars of deployed capital infrastructure. Real oligopolistic um, kind of nature of the industry. So you need to be big, and you know, you need to kind of be synergistic with that trillion dollars of capital stock if you can. If you can't, you know, you need a trillion dollars for new capital stock, but also you're going to have all these um, people fighting you. And then the last one is really the ease of use, you know, how the thing fits in regulations. Cement builds buildings, people live in buildings. You know, there's a whole host, enormous, enormous amount of regulations and interlocking and completely separate regulations at all levels, you know, the national level, state level, local level um, on public safety. So it's really hard to like change this material, improve that in 30 years, that building's still gonna be safe. 
you know, with a new material and stuff like that. So, so a lot of this applies to materials and I look at this as a process. So it's sort of one is like the end, what you put in two and three are sort of like what you do in the process and four is what comes out of the process. Um, so that's sort of my own framework for thinking about this. Um, and then I just kind of put this in a, in a, in a, I, I don't know, some sort of a format that you can look at the sector and look at innovations through this. I just said, okay, if you have widely available economic raw materials and can produce um, a material that in and the out are okay, that I call that industrial feasibility. Um, and then if the variable costs and the capital costs are okay, I call that economic feasibility. Um, so, you know, when you look at this, you can look at the sector. And this, are, this is just some examples it's actually from a couple of years back, you know, when I was looking at the sector in this and I, I started to identify, hey, there's interesting things that are already generally known in the industry. There's four that I identified at this point that I thought were really interesting in this framework. Um, and I think with regards to electrification, there's not real challenges for industrial feasibility because you're generally using the same raw materials and producing the same material at the end. Um, it's really more a challenge of economic feasibility and especially variable cost. Well, I'll comment very quickly on these four and then we'll talk a little bit about electrification. So, so you know, these four that I identified at that point um, one of them is really, you know, binder efficiency. It's like the, the industry is now, I think, taking this up a lot more. It's just the concept that, you know, in a in concrete where you use cement as a glue with um, sand and aggregates, there's, there's like a whole bunch of interparticle space that doesn't necessarily need to be there in the microstructure. Like you can use um, particle size optimized fillers. And it's the same if you've ever seen a video of, you know, someone filling up a jar with marbles and sand and water, you know, it's the same concept at the microstructure level, you know, can you use particle size optimized fillers to reduce the need for cement, you know, so, so calcium silicate hydrate doesn't need to fill up this interparticle space because there's already a bunch of particles there. That's kind of the, the concept of this one, you know, a lot of research on how to use chemical admixtures to control rheology, gradation, disper like dispersion, you know, workability of the material, which is really promising, um, especially by uh, Vanderlei John in Brazil. You know, he has excellent, excellent research on this. And this is some of that. Um, and then, you know, another one is very commonly used supplementary cementitious materials, which are often either natural or industrial waste derived. Um, that's something that the industry is already, you know, using pretty broadly, but some of those are, you know, fly ash is linked to coal-fired power plants. So that's phasing out. You really need to develop an next class of supplemental sedimentitious materials. And you can do that by getting a very cheap um, beneficiation technique a lot of the time for um, other things that are around, whether they're natural or industrial materials. Um, and if they have some amorphous silica fraction, or if they have a reactive metal oxide in it, you know, you can, or if you can beneficiate it, so you have a homogenous and cheap material that has that, that's really good. And actually electrification has a really um, interesting potential application in the um, thermal beneficiation of of a some of the a emerging SEMs, especially calcined clay, I think, because that happens at a temperature where electrification makes more sense. Um, so that's a SEMs, both traditional and emerging. Carbon capture, you know, we could talk a lot about it, but I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on that. You know, the basic issue again is cost with that. And a lot of that's the parasitic energy load. Um, so if you're going to regenerate a sorbent and you need three gigajoules of energy per regeneration of that sorbent when you only needed three gigajoules to produce cement in the first place. So you double the energy intensity of the sector. That's a problem. You know, one of the most interesting projects I've seen is indirect calcination. This is a project called Lilac, um, which is owned by a company called Calix. And that just says, hey, if you heat this raw meal indirectly, you get a pure stream of CO2 off of the top of the factory. So it's not all mixed up with the combustion emissions. Um, and I think that's a very powerful idea because you don't have parasitic energy load or, or increased OPEX, um, but hey, what do you do with that CO2 in the end? That's the other problem that still needs to be solved. And again, electrification is really interesting here. This is a gas-fired version, but Calyx has also developed an electrified, fully electrified um, version of this, both for magnesium and for calcium, and a, it's a used into the cement process. Um, so that's, a, that's an interesting innovation, I think, on the calcination um, section of the cement plant. Um, and calcination is interesting because it happens around 900 and not not 1500. So it's a lot less challenging for electrification. Um, so that's about the carbon capture. And then uh, the other one quickly to highlight is just digital. Uh, you know, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in digital, um, but there is a role for machine learning and heavy industrial process optimization. Um, you know, you can get in reality <clears throat> 10 or 20% efficiency increase 
um, often by just targeting a higher, like a, a smaller margin of quality on the clinker production or things like that. And then if you apply this machine learning um, between the cement industry and the concrete industry, like you can get a, a significant additional um, improvements on that. But this is, there's a, it's hard to find in the sector what's real and what's not, but there's a hand, there's probably two companies in the world, you know, that have something I think is really um, worthwhile on this. And this is just a, like one of these little companies, it's not, it's not a big company at this point, but they have really interesting um, a optimization models for this thing. So one company that does that is called Optimative in Northern Spain. They have a, a really interesting real-time optimizer. Another one is Faro Labs out of New York, um, which has a, an excellent system for process engineers to, to get that additional 10 or 15% from heavy industrial processes, steel, cement, et cetera. Um, so I think those are all interesting. Here's another optimization model. Um, so that was those four that I had identified. For this, I, I kind of had a thought, hey, what's emerging now? Um, and you know, three of those, it, CO2 mineralization, I think there's a lot of synergistic mineralization technologies that are, are and can be used in the cement industry. Biogenic solid fuel, especially carbonization of methanogenic high moisture content waste to produce next generation biogenic alternative fuels, I think is interesting. But most interesting for us is really, you know, can you use intermittent renewables um, to produce very high temperature heat via electrification. Um, and that's, that's, I think, extraordinarily powerful thing. Why? Because, you know, if you look at electrification generally, <clears throat> the calciner is less difficult to electrify than the kiln. The calciner operates around 900 or 1000 Celsius. So you don't have the same um, material issues that if you're going to try to heat things to um, 1500 or change of 1500 Celsius process, you would have. Um, so that's a lot easier. It's uh, calciner is actually more than half of the energy generally in a cement plant because calcination um, actually, in addition to the heating, needs a lot of energy to, to take place um, to break that bond and to release CO2. Um, so that, you know, and the other thing about that is if you do direct electrification of calcination, you again get the CO2 concentration benefit because you don't have combustion emissions in that segment. So it's very interesting. Um, how do you, like this, this is actually ongoing. Like I mentioned, Calyx Lilac is doing electrification uh, via indirect calcination. Um, there's other kinds of electri electrified calciners that are under development. Fortunately, I can't really mention because some of them are a little bit more um, internal industry confidential stuff. Um, and there's actually even stuff on a like real deep research and projects that have been done on, you know, plasma fired full cement plant, you know, in full kiln process. Um, um, redoing, you know, by by industrial companies um, that yields. Okay, this is interesting. This can be done. And the biggest problem is again the cost. And that is, you know, if you need a base load twenty four seven available electricity, it's a very high cost compared to combusting fossil fuels or waste, which the cement industry does. Um, and it's it, that that is like the main issue that, that I see a blocking the electrification of cement industry is actually the cost of electricity. And I think the most interesting idea is to say, how do you take intermittent renewable electricity? You know, how do you carve off the four or five or six hours a day when it's cheap because of the dock curve, you know, when you can get these um, high concentration of renewables <clears throat> and then transform that into very high temperature, 24 seven available industrial heat. That's, that's the key problem to solve electrification in the cement industry, I think. Um, because that will bring down the cost of doing electrification, at least for the cal center and potentially for more of the cement plant. So if you can actually achieve that, um, I, I think that unlocks a lot for electrification in the industry. And then I would say most interesting project that I've seen on that is really, um, you know, a company called Rondo Energy that's in the Bay Area. Um, this is a, a company that just says, okay, how do we bring um, thermal storage down to earth in terms of its cost and make it economically viable now. Um, and here you can see a little bit, you know, this is this duck curve from an example day in California in the concept of the company of, okay, we're going to charge at the time when a electricity is the cheapest, but we're going to deliver a base load, um, a, a renewable or base load renewable electricity derived high temperature heat. Um, and that is extremely powerful, I think, for the cement process, because you can use that, you know, for the heating of the material, you can use that in the calciner. A, if it's around 1,000 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, the company's already has um, very good success in doing 1,000 or 1,100 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> but if you also can get to 1,500 Celsius, which is within the target of the company, you can actually look at electrifying the entire 
um, cement production process. So this is an emerging technology I think is really interesting um, because it solves the problem of cost of electrification, which is really central to everything. You can currently electrify cement production, but no one wants to do it because the energy cost is six or eight times higher. Um, but if you do this, you can bring that down so it has a comparable or even sometimes lower energy cost um, than combusting fossil fuels, especially in jurisdictions where the combustion of fossil fuels um, is taxed from taxed at a CO2 level, like in the European Union. So for each ton of coal, you know, you have 2.7 times 80 euros of additional cost. And this brings um, Rondo or, or thermal storage systems like that that can get to these high temperature heat through load shifting during a day um, down to a, a very interesting cost just on economics alone. So yeah, that's that's I guess the quick thing. I hope I hope the I hope I'm within my time, but you know that's that's a my, my a little bit how to apply that framework to electrification that that I can think of for this um, conference. Thank you so much, Eric. That was a really interesting talk and a very interesting perspective coming at this um, with with your experience and, and kind of thinking about uh, the process and how it connects to the industry priorities and the bottom line on cost. Um, so. I, I see we have some great questions. Um, I'm going to circle back to those questions afterwards so that we get a chance to uh, hear from some of our other panelists. Um, and, and so I will uh, kind of open this up um, with, with a broader question, um, starting with Pulakesh and uh, Muriganshu, um, of what do you guys see as uh, the um, kind of priorities uh, in decarbonization and, and the strategies that are gaining the most traction um, versus seen as needing the most traction. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. So glad to be here. Those are very interesting presentation. So the way we look at this sector, unlike any commodity sector, and Eric highlighted that, it's about cost. So first, does it work? Performance matters in this sector because it's, we are talking about building safety is extremely important. And the second important thing is the cost part of it. So the challenge what I see in this sector is there are obviously today, there are solutions that you can actually make concrete without using any cement and the performance is there. The reason those are not in the market is mainly twofold. First is there's no framework or specification like ASTM code to bring new materials and qualify them. And second is the cost part of it. So given these two sectors where we'll look at and see what else can is happening. So people are talking about definitely alternative fuels, synthetic SCMs, which will be a substitute. So one of the places where you can have a major impact is in the cement, can you substitute, especially if you look at ready mix today, approximately 75% is cement and 25% is the other material. Can you change that ratio and actually use 25% cement and the rest as SCM and other process and things. Also critical, which has been highlighted a little bit in today's session, and especially in the previous session about the system level thinking is really looking at the life cycle analysis is, is it really better than the incumbent process? When somebody's claiming can stand up to the audit. And when I look at that, I look at the cradle to grave and you do that analysis and said, one is the incumbent, the other is the alternative process. Where I'm seeing some innovation happening, especially if you want to use other alternative is in the area of activators and admixtures and chemistry will play a major role as well. Thank you. I'll turn this over to Mriganshu now to give us that, that same picture um, from the steel perspective. So first of all, uh, good morning everyone. And at the, at the outset, uh, let me thanks uh, on behalf of Tata Steel for having me here uh, today amid this August gathering. Uh, in fact, uh, um, being from steel industry, I could not agree more with uh, uh, Professor Arun Majumdar, when during his opening keynote, he identified steel along with two more industries. I think cement was one and another one was something else as vital to villains of this whole gigaton level of CO2 minutes on planet Earth. Uh, but he also briefly touched upon some of the reasons and after that several speakers also brought up uh, this broad strategies uh, for tackling these overall issues. So uh, as per my thought process, I think that uh, terms like decarbonization or electrification, these are kind of summarization of the overall strategies. But at the tactical level, we know it's not uh, 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 straight jacketed things like one size fits all. 
So, uh, for example, if I take example of our steel industry, so where blast furnace root of iron making, which is uh, kind of the CO2 emitting monster of any steel industry. And uh, blast furnace is a common process which is available in most of the large scale steel, uh, large scale and integrated steel plants. And, and the reason for this is uh, because the uniqueness and typical characteristics of these processes, because these processes again have several interlinked sub processes. And not only that, I mean, the complication doesn't end there. So it, it, it also depends on several kind of inputs. Uh, I mean to say the raw material and they keep on changing. So there are several parameters which actually comes into play and, and that's a that's the key reason why it is so uh, I mean critical to address this whole issue. So uh, so say on that same example of blast furnace process, so if we tend to use hydrogen or natural gas as an alternate source of fuel, but you know we cannot use it uniquely or or, or, or a similar solution cannot be used across different blast furnaces. So there lies the challenge. Uh, and again, another thing is that uh, uh, as far as electrification is concerned, so sometimes I feel that we often use this term electrification for our own convenience without caring for whether uh, the electricity produced is really green or not. So if it is not green, so then actually we have not cleaned the, this CO, whole entire CO2 mark. So uh, rather we have actually played the game of passing the box. So that's what I feel. So, uh, and, and to top it all, the, the most challenging thing, especially in steel industry, because this industry, which is, uh, I mean, most of the places, it is quite old. I mean, this, this industry is here for centuries, more than centuries. So, uh, I mean, adapting something, this new technology or retrofitting is a, a big bottleneck, often, often time. So that's what we also feel. So, uh, uh, I mean, giving all these things, I think, uh, I, I, mean, I, I think yesterday one of the speakers, he very nicely put it. So he said that uh, 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 basically we have to adopt technologies which are across different technology readiness levels. So maybe we have to utilize something which is uh, where we, uh, we might have to invest time and effort to research something new. Maybe uh, some of the issues, uh, uh, solutions are readily available. We can maybe we can connect with other industries, other partners, and we can find solution. In fact, in Tata Steel, we have adapted our strategy exactly in similar line, in this line only. So we have adapted uh, uh, technologies where uh, uh, some of the things they are ready to be used directly, uh, maybe from some of the other adjacent industries. Uh, and there are certain issues where we do not find a ready-made solution. So there actually we have started our own, uh, you know, research and development. And again, we are, we are doing it collaboratively with uh, academia and industry. So I think, I think that's the way forward for our cover kind of industry. Thank you. That's um, a really great perspective. And what, what you bring up here is a good point. And kind of the purpose of this, this uh, workshop is to discuss kind of how to make these big steps forward of these transitional technologies and, and changes where we do have to um, introduce risk uh, that uh, is traditionally hard to do. Um, so Eric, you brought up very effectively um, this, this concern of the trade-off, the bottom line, how to, um, how to prevent even 10 cents per ton of uh, increase in cost. Um, and, and in steel, I, I know that there is a similar um, type of a picture. I don't have the numbers offhand. Um, so what do you, uh, and I'll ask this to the room at large, what do you see as um, strategies that really are needed here to be able to um, enable this type of transition, this type of taking a risk in these massive, massive industries that are so ingrained and such have such large infrastructures. Um, I, I would just comment from my side. Um, I think, I think one of the things is at the funding stage, the research and the um, research funding stage, the investment stage, et cetera, for new technologies, the potential cost of those technologies should be the primary, one of the primary determining factors of that. Because there's a huge amount of things that are funded at the research level or, you know, at the even, even funded for pilot projects that are just 
obviously not going to be economically viable. Um, and I and I think it's you know it, it needs to play a more central role in decision making um, for looking at early stage technologies. You know, in, in some cases, you you effectively can't really understand are they going to be so. So there's some gray area, a large gray area there. But there's in some cases where you absolutely know it's going to be more expensive. And I think the industry doesn't need to like try to avoid that. It just will. It just will not implement anything that's going to increase its variable cost. Um, and then I think on the policy side, carbon tax. You know, if there's no carbon tax, there's no, there's absolutely no way to get a whole class of emerging technologies. And you can see in Europe, you know, there's a lot more innovation um, coming from the fact that the EU ETS applies to cement industry for, you know, 15 or 20 years now. Um, so yeah, those are those are my quick comments. Let me add to Eric, um, in the sector, for any commodity sector, not just in here, uh, the customer does not care about the technology. They care about the specification. And once it's made, the specification is the cost structure. So as was mentioned before, so there will be no one silver bullet everywhere, depending on where it is, different solution will take place. So what is needed is a good regulatory framework, which looks at the total cost of ownership. It's not just a cost of ownership of a particular segment or something, but what is my total cost of ownership? If there's a carbon tax, so people will look at and give an example of hydrogen, for a customer, they don't care if it's blue, green, white, black. Does it meet the low carbon standard specification? Do I have it on specs and what is the cost? So that is what is needed is that framework to define that. And then people can look at the total cost of ownership. Liara, I have a question, a follow-up question for Eric. Clearly we are talking about costs and I'm wonder um, whether sometimes costs should also be consider or look at more holistically. And what I mean is the following. Um, the cost that, for example, Eric showed um, refers to cement, and that does not include, for example, the cost of steel that comes later when uh, concrete is, is made. And so sometimes I feel, and clearly I'm not, it's not my expertise, um, that things are, we are comparing apple with uh, um, oranges because the cost refers only to cement and not the whole um, uh, composite, um, so including steel. And the second question that I have, um, how is usually durability factored in? Because clearly the more we have to replace concrete, the more cost it will, uh, will have. Yeah. Thanks, Tiziana. I, I, I think that's, um, I mean, those are excellent questions. Um, on the first one, you know, I, I, I limited my talk. I actually removed a lot of the stuff about concrete in my talk today because I, I understood we're talking about cement electrification. Um, I, I think you just have to look at who are the players in the industry and what is the cost structure of each player in the industry, and they make decisions on that basis. Now, and in cement, you know, these are the costs. That's the reflection. They don't care about steel at all. No one cares about steel in, like, in cement unless they're also producing steel. You know, they just care about selling cement. Now, if you look at concrete companies, they also don't care about steel. You know, who cares about steel? The, the um, I, I guess the project owners that are designing a, a structure that's going to be a structural element in a building, they who care about steel. And actually the architects, may or may not care about steel, you know, the suppliers of those placing servers, they may or may not care about steel. The only person who's really going to care about that is who's paying the bill for the whole building, you know, and, and that's extremely hard because there's this huge value chain of people. And like that person who who's paying for the building doesn't have any technical expertise a lot of time on that stuff. So you have to like get architects, owners, engineers, owners together and talk like, oh, how do we get a new generation of material that's going to replace this deal? And, you know, there's use of fibers and things like that. So, but I, I agree, that's a complex question, but I think each industry, you have to operate within the logic of that. If you're going to try to de decarbonize cement, they don't care about steel. If you're going to try to decarbonize concrete, they also really don't care about steel. If you're going to try to decarbonize buildings, you know, they, they might, whoever's paying for that building is going to care you know, if you can, if you can do that or not, and whoever's responding for the carbon footprint. So that's on the first question. And um, sorry, remind me the second question. Well, was... The second question was more about how durability uh, is uh, and yeah. serviceability is factored in. Yeah, badly difficult. Um, that's probably one of the most problematic issues for new material 
um, developments into the industry because there are a lot of things that you could look at, you know, resistance to chemical attack or, you know, a, I don't know, there's a whole bunch of tests you could perform in a lab, but like a lot of the time, the only test that people will accept on durability is like, there's a building, it's been there for 30 years. And, and that really makes it difficult. And I think you can do accelerated testing and cycling it and stuff like that. But a lot of, um, it's, it's very difficult to convince regulatory committees um, and insurance companies and all those about the long-term durability of material if you haven't had it for at least a decade or two, you know, somewhere in some environment. And I, I think that really slows down the pace of innovation, um, but it's because it's related to public safety and, and massive potential liabilities. So imagine you build a bridge, you know, with a material and then it collapses at any point in time, the liabilities and the public safety issues around that are enormous. But I would say that's one of the most difficult issues. And I think it's Larry Sutter, um, in academia who talks really a lot about durability and has some interesting um, thinking about that. He sits on a lot of the ASTM committees. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're if you want a more insightful or nuanced view on how people deal with that or what they're working on for emerging, you know, tests for long-term durability or how the industry perceives that, I definitely recommend to talk with him. But I, I think it's a difficult and and not and poorly solved issue currently. Um. That, that's very uh, interesting, and and um, I think uh, uh, an interesting point to be made actually from the steel side as well, because I would say there's definitely um, feelings of you know these are two separate beasts. Uh, they we shouldn't consider each other as we're doing this, but there are inputs from steel making to cement making and vice versa, right? So I think um, seeing the other side of this picture is also of interest. Um, Chris, you had mentioned this from the perspective of the um, changes that have happened in the steelmaking industry. Um, where do you see that the challenges are hindered in this field for the next step in, in the transformation here? Sadly, is Exactly as, as the other said, it's, it's cost. It's going to be more expensive. Uh, if it wasn't going to be more expensive, we would be doing this already. Um, right now, there isn't a cost to emitting carbon from electric furnaces in the US. So we burn an awful lot of carbon in these furnaces. It, it helps you to make high quality steel, but probably we do it a little bit excessively, but that's okay in terms of the, the quality and, and the cost at which it can be produced. Um, and the, uh, some of the estimates of the costs are, are really um, you know, quite daunting. Uh, so if you were to directly exchange natural gas to make direct reduced iron with green hydrogen at $4 per kilogram, that'll add 200 and something dollars per ton of steel. Uh, so that's, that's a huge increase, which you know, if, if there's another cheaper, more carbon intensive source of steel available, uh, you know, it, it'll be very hard to persuade end users not to use that unless there are very clear carbon taxes. So this, this is this, this complex uh, interplay of factors, all of which must work uh, simultaneously. So, so cost is definitely, I think the biggest one, I mean, there, there are technical challenges, but um, we've been using hydrogen in one way or another in this industry for a long time, probably not as pure hydrogen, typically as hydrogen mixed with carbon monoxide, but pretty high concentrations of, of hydrogen. So there are some remaining technical issues for which I'm grateful being an academic who researches these things, but, um, Frankly, I don't think those, those are the, the biggest issues. What are strategies that you see to de-risk that industry, to kind of de-risk those types of investments? Um, yeah, so some of it is, is to, to show um, pilot installations of this. So there is that um, pilot project underway in, in Sweden, which puts these elements together of having a, a large scale electrolyzer, uh, direct reduced iron plant and an electric furnace to, to melt down the product. And I would be very surprised if it doesn't work. Um, but I mean, that, that does um, provide some faith that, that it can work. And similarly, um, POSCO is, is doing that with their fluidized bed 
type uh, type process. Um, so that that will help. Um, I think the industry though accepts that it's probably technically feasible, but not proven at scale yet. So so yeah, I, I think that that'll help at least a little bit. So I think this is this this question of how do you prove something at scale that is a new technology um, in time for uh, you know to be able to prevent uh, some of the biggest um, catastrophes in climate change uh, is a big and, and very important question on all of our minds right now. So I think I'm going to open this question up to the entire uh, panel of where do you see um, that this this concept of, of de-risking so that we can demonstrate uh, scalability in these types of technologies that are new and considered untested um, in time. Uh, Pulakesh, uh, I see you also went off mute. Do you want to um, comment on this? This is where the incumbent plays a massive role because for the scale needed on both the supply chain and also the risk and the technical understanding, that's where incumbent like Tata Steel or other steel companies or the cement companies like they need to play a role and they are playing the role. So that's where yesterday people talked about cooperation. That's the cooperation needed between early stage academic research incubators, those who are taking the technical risk, like this is like us, along with the incumbent playing a role. The other point I want to highlight and Chris mentioned, we are talking about cost, but we have to think about the total cost of ownership. So let's say there is a carbon tax of 50 to $100. So for those who are producing, you need to compare the total tax in the system and the total cost. So a lot of the things we are talking today does not compete with cost, with the existing cost of production, but not necessarily with if there are regulations or other specification coming in with a total cost of production. And that's one way of looking at it, which I think will help the industry. Thank you. Uh, very well said. Um, so we have a couple minutes left. Um, uh, Mriganchu, do you want to comment on this? Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe I, I, I tend to agree with what Pulakesh just now mentioned, but uh, uh, you know, for any untested technology, if you have to establish uh, that, it also has a, uh, I mean, it, it does take a lot of time. So I can cite one example from Tata Steel. So like uh, our European uh, uh, unit, they already started developing an alternate iron making process. I think Professor uh, Pistorius and many many of the many of the panel members here would be knowing about it. So it is called High Sarna. So it's actually a collaboration between erstwhile uh, Torres Steel plant with uh, uh, Rio Tinto of Australia. So they demonstrated the process and then they upscaled the process sometime in 2010 and they created a pilot plant in uh, our Imodin uh, uh, plant, uh, uh, steel uh, manufacturing facility. And uh, in fact, they demonstrated that, that this new process is capable of reducing the CO2 emission by 50% without even using uh, carbon capture. Uh, but still, it is not commercialized. I mean, even even if we have demonstrated it at that level, so even we need to demonstrate it at, at, at even higher level. And plans are on to set up another full-scale plant somewhere in India. So uh, sometimes this uh, lifetime of developing a technology is also something which one has to be mindful about. So I think that that is one point I, I thought I would add from uh, steel industry side. Thank you. Um, Eric, did you want to comment on this as well? I think it's a very relevant question on the policy side. Um, I, I really think, yeah, somehow, how, somehow looking for how to support the demand side on the, on the government, how to support the demand side and how to level the playing field on the government side is probably the best strategy to say like, um, a lot of what's happening currently in the US um, on procurement of low carbon materials. I think it's it's great because it allows you to have markets for that. And I think what's happening in the EU on um, taxing the emissions of CO2 or taxing it or creating a cap and trade scheme or in California, there's a lot of public policy on you know um, putting some sorts of schemes. So things that produce a lot of CO2 are less economically viable. I think that's great. Uh, where I think there's a lot of issues 
you know, and I, I guess a lot of people would disagree with me, um, but beyond just the basic research funding, where the government starts to get involved in like backing particular technologies, you know, I, I think a lot of errors could be made there. And a lot of a lot of errors can be made in saying, you know, this is the technology that's going to um, bring us forward, you know, because the way the industry can present those or the technologists can present those are oftentimes to tell the story that the government wants to hear on the on that. And you know, the I, I think the real innovation will happen. The real support from the public policy and the government side is create a level playing field in which if you emit a ton of CO two, you pay something for that or you have a penalty for that, and then let the innovators in the industry figure out that stack of technologies to respond to the actual market and make sure also on the demand side, you know, you're going to, someone's going to purchase low carbon cement and make sure the, the, um, the CO2 is somehow having a cost. That's, that's where I see the best role of government. Okay. There's some role in, in early stage R and D or in, you know, funding some stuff, but where you start to have fully or mostly government funded pilots, Oftentimes, it's just, you know, someone will say, hey, it'd be nice to do a pilot with this technology, you know, and, and they'll make whatever paperwork the, the government needs to see for that. So anyway, it's a, it's a problem for, it's not that that has no role. It's just a problem that I see um, for public policy makers to, to really get through the smoke and mirrors around those, um, those applications and understand which technology. So I see it's better, you know, if there's a choice um, to be on the side of creating the level play of field and creating the demand. Thank you. So we'll turn now to um, some questions from the audience. Uh, I see that um, Dhruv Arora um, asked a question. Uh, is there a thinking about market, dri market driven innovation where customers who are willing for the lower carbon footprint to uh, cement to be able to pay for it as well? Um a market innovation where customers who want lower carbon cement can pay for it. I mean, I guess they just choose to do that. So, so I, I mean, the government has chosen to do that with the GSO, just like two weeks ago, made an announcement, you know, we're going to procure low carbon cement. New York state has chosen to do that in some respect. Um, and they have public procurement, but private companies can just do that if they want. And actually Amazon or Microsoft or companies like that do do that. But I, I don't know what, further market innovation is needed. I think on the public policy and procurement side, um, there are innovations on that to say, oh, how do we measure this and how do we procure it? Um, but on the on the private company side, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. It's just, hey, does the market demand from them to do that? You know, so, so I don't know, putting regulations on embodied carbon in buildings and, you know, giving, giving, giving building permits easier um, for lower carbon buildings or things like that, that could tend to stimulate the private demand too. But I, it's hard because the private markets are not regulated. It's hard to figure out what innovation is needed there. It just thought, it operates on economic principles. What I can add is, is something similar is definitely happening uh, in the steel market as well. So Nucor has, has branded some of their steel to be uh, essentially zero carbon, at least as far as scope one and scope two emissions are concerned. So they are a, a big um, buyer of, of clean electricity and scrap recycling. Um, so, so they are seeing that as, as an advantage in, in the market. Um, the other advantage is it sells at, I think, exactly the same price as any other steel, except it's, it's zero carbon as well. Uh, so, so that's uh, of course, the advantage they have in in being a, a recycler. So I think there there are various uh, ventures like that that will come up, um, but um, that will get us some other way. But of course, the the really big shift to making the whole industry zero carbon that's that will require um, a lot more and and will imply higher costs. Thank you. So there, there's also, a uh, uh, yes. Leora, can you can I also add something uh, yes. uh, after the story? Uh, that is, uh, especially in steel industry, there is an independent third party certification program called Responsible Steel. So uh, I mean, a lot of uh, steel plants are actually going for this certification, which is uh, called as Responsible Steel. So they are basically a non profit organization, and they are coming up with uh, uh, sustainability performance standards. 
and they give certification to leading seal banks. So, uh, like Tata Steel is also one of the responsible steel certified. Arcelor Mittal is one of the uh, responsible steel certified companies. So, all these big name companies they are going for such certification. Hmm. It's it's interesting to see that because it's also higher up the the supply chain, right? So it's not something that a typical consumer would be purchasing. Um, and it's interesting to see that that's effective. Um, so we also got another uh, question in the chat. Um, Chastity Lee asks, uh, what ballpark amount or cost of carbon tax would be sufficient to make the economics more favor or more in favor of adopting existing green technology now? I can answer, I mean, in cement, it depends on, so there's a whole bunch of, like, there's a cost curve. So if you have five or 10 or $20 a ton, you know, you can already do some stuff um, depending on how you apply that tax. But um, to get a broad, like complete decarbonization of the cement industry um, and carbon capture, because you have a billion plus tons of just um, process emissions, you know, that's going to be at least $7,500 a ton um, to be able to do that. And and some people would argue it's more. I just think that the the cost of carbon capture is coming down. And it will also depend on the government um, providing some regulation and infrastructure for carbon transportation and storage. So so yeah, if you have the carbon, the carbon transportation and storage somehow taken care of by the government, even at you know $50, $60 a ton, you could do a lot of that stuff. If you if you don't, then you know it's difficult to do even at a higher higher amount. Uh, that's that's uh, at least my read into that. But you can already do stuff at $20, $30 a ton for sure. Thank you. Um, Chris, do you have a comment on that for, for steel? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a little bit similar for steel. Um, going whole scale from natural gas for DRI to, to hydrogen um, implies a crazy number like $300 per, per ton of CO2, which which uh, presumably we won't get to, I hope. Um, but yeah, there, there are some interim measures that will spur innovations in how electric furnaces are run um, at, at the sort of $20, $30 um, level that, that, that will already help. Thank you. So this was a great discussion. Um, we're, we're running out of time now, or well, we're out of time now. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our speakers um, for a, a wonderful discussion. Uh, I think that we discussed some really interesting ideas about um, where the industry is, both in cement and in steel, and um, a, a really interesting picture of um, the role that, that policy and the incumbents and the uh, new innovators need to take in being able to um, evaluate both, both the cost structure, uh, cost of ownership um, versus the cost of the process um, to be able to, to kind of shift towards these newer directions or decarbonize directions. Um, so with that, I will uh, thank all of our speakers again and turn it back to uh, Richard um, to uh, continue on this program. Okay. Thank you, Leora, and thank you to all the panelists. Um, had actually two great panels today, and uh, I hope you've had a, a all of you have um, found today's uh, meeting um, informative and, and uh, really inspiring.